I'd like to thank some of the sponsors we have for this event. Golden Artist Colors have been very generous, and I don't know if any of you have done any research on their website, but they do a really great job of putting information out there for artists. There's lots of tutorials, videos, articles. We actually have some newsletters in the back of their Just Paint newsletter if you're interested in um, learning a little bit more about that. Um, of course, as I mentioned, Arts of the Armory. The Armory was very generous to let us use the space tonight. The Somerville Arts Council um, offered me great consulting. I've never planned an event like this before, and they helped me to get the word out. And then I also need to thank Jessa DeMora from Funnel Cake Marketing. Um, she's very connected in the art scene, and she definitely got the word out to everyone. And she, I'm really grateful for that. Um, so I should introduce myself. My name is Melissa King. I'm a professional pet portrait artist. I work in Somerville. I have a studio um, at Joy Street Studios. I've been working professionally as an artist for six years. I've also, I'm also pursuing a career in art conservation, and I have about seven years of experience. They call it pre-program experience before you get into a graduate program. And I just found out last Friday that I was accepted into graduate school, so I will be seeing <laughs> I'll be starting this summer at the Winterthur University of Delaware program in art conservation. Um, so art conservation is a, a, a very highly specialized career. Um, in order to be an art conservator, you need to have training in chemistry, studio art, and art history. Um, as conservators, we learn to identify materials and understand how they age, and um, as well as how they interact with the envir environment. I thought I would share this, if you can see, this is um, some example of my artwork. Um, I go by Pablo Picasso and I paint pet portraits. And um, on the bottom image you'll see uh, there's a mural that I painted. I apologize for the quality. Um, but for this mural I actually called Golden Paints. There's a number you can find on their website. Uh, and talked to a material scientist and um, discussed with them some of the concerns I had about painting a mural in a doggy daycare and they gave me a good solution for um, varnishing it and the proper way to preserve the mural. Um, this, the image on the right is um, an image that I posted on my Instagram account. Um, so as I mentioned, as a conservator and as an artist, I've become very extremely interested in doing whatever I can to, as an artist to pr make my artwork last. So I've worked with many conservators and I've spoken to a lot of them and I have started to include backing board on the back of my, all of my paintings. Um, it provides structural support but it also um, does a good job of um, preventing dirt and dust and anything from collecting in the from behind the painting. And I've also started, to, it's hard to see in this photo, but I've attached care instructions um, the specifically for my type of um, painting. Um, that's, you know, in hopes that my customers, once they take their paintings away, will have a better understanding of how to, to keep their painting clean and preserve it. So this is my Instagram account. I have uh, used this Instagram as a platform to reach out to customers and I suppose other artists, anyone that might follow me. And they, I've actually been using it as a marketing tool to, to show my customers, like, look, I really care about the preservation of my artwork. I really want to make sure that these paintings that you pay me, like, a decent amount of money for will last. So I really, truly believe that it adds a lot of value to your artwork to, to really consider these things and to let people know that you're considering these things. Um, so enough about me. I would like to introduce the panel. Over here on the left is Rika Smith-McNally. She is a graduate of the Rhode Island. Oh yeah, you can clap if you'd like. <laughs> she is a graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design. Has an MS in Art Conservation from the Winter Winterthur University of Delaware Art Conservation Program, and a certificate in Conservation from Harvard University Art Museums. Her published re published research research includes a study of protective coatings on outdoor bronzes, the inherent causes of deterioration of 15th century French Limoges enam enamels, the materials and techniques of the Harvard glass flowers, and the preservation of modern contemporary outdoor sculpture. She is currently the director of art conservation for the city of Cambridge, where she uses prefabrication conservation reviews in her work with artists on new commissions. And next to her, we have Maggie Wessling. And Maggie holds a BA in Art History and Studio Art from Columbia University and an MA in Art History and Advanced Certificate in Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works from New York University. 
Presently, Maggie is the Morse Fellow of Paper Conservation at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, where she works on the conservation treatment and exhibition of works of art on paper and photographs. Maggie has a specific interest in photography and has completed research project, projects on facsimile printing techniques in news photography, platinum and palladium photography, and she has explored the applications of digital imaging software for the monitoring of daguerreotypes and other artworks. Um, over here we have Kate Smith. Uh, Kate Smith is Associate Paintings Conservator at the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies at the Harvard Art Museums. Kate received her BA in Art History from Smith College in 1994 and her Masters of Arts in Paintings Conservation from Buffalo State College in 2001. In 2008, she was Assistant Conservator at the Strauss Center, focusing on the conservation of the mural cycles at the Boston Public Library. Kate held assistant conservator positions at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum for John Franco Poco Bene Studio and the, at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston before returning to the Harvard Art Museums in 2011 where she specializes in the technical examination of paintings. And then lastly, we have Christopher Sokolowski. He earned a BA in studio art from Bates College, an MA in art history from the University of Massachusetts, and an MS in art conservation from the Winterthur University of Delaware Program in Art Conservation. He has worked in the paper conservation studios at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, the Musée de Louvre, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Studio TKM, and the Northeast Document Conservation Center. Since 2009, he has served at the Harvard Library as a paper conservator for special collections in the Wiseman Preservation Center. He also makes paintings and has given much thought to making them last. That's a good way to end that. Um, so I've come up with a few questions that I thought were very broad that would apply to most everyone in the room. And uh, each member of the panel has prepared different answers for these. So the first question is, can you share a specific case study of a piece of art that you have come across where a more educated knowledge of materials could have aided in its preservation, especially if this material is not an artistic and aesthetic choice? And we'll start with Rita. Okay, thank you. Can you bring my first slide? Oh, yes. <coughs> the case study that I chose for tonight does not have anything to do with the artists not reaching out to me. It has nothing to do with how I specify the work to be done. So it doesn't answer the question directly, but we'll get to the problem and find the answer. Okay, the next slide. This is a piece um, that is on uh, the Yorkshire Road underpass in Cambridge. And um, I'm not going to tell you the artist's name. You may know, but I don't want anyone to think that he didn't do a good job, because he really did. What happened with the piece is that the artist made a trellis so that it draws you into the underpass. It's really fantastic. And then there were birds along the side of the concrete wall. Everybody in the neighborhood just adores it. So a year after we put it up, there were teeny little cracks appearing in the paint and I couldn't figure out why that was happening. So I just decided to watch it. And then next year, there was more paint. And then the third year, this is what it looked like. The paint was just absolutely falling off. There was terrible rust of the mild steel underneath, and I was totally perplexed. So I went back and talked to the artist. I had gotten to know the fabricator, but only over the phone. And he had come very highly recommended, and I had sent him the type of paint that should be used, and he said, oh yeah, no problem. So took a look at this, and as I looked at it um, in a little bit more depth, I took a piece and looked at it under the microscope, I realized that there was a paint layer that was missing. When you do this type of painting, there is a primer layer made out of zinc, there's another layer made out of epoxy, and then there's a top layer, a layer that's an aliphatic um, polyurethane. So I called the fabricator and said, you sure you used the right thing? So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, I called him a few times and he stopped answering the phone. Um, so what I did is I took a paint sample and sent it out for analysis. And what we found is that the zinc layer that he was supposed to put on was not the right type. It was something he bought at like Home Depot. And he didn't bother putting the second coating on. And the reason he did that is that he hadn't realized how expensive the top coat of black paint was. It's $400 a gallon. So 
secret artist, <laughs> how much paint costs, it can cost more. So we found out what happened. We decided in this case not to bother the art fabricator. We did tell him what happened. And I don't think he will ever do this again. And if you could go to the next slide. This is how the painting should be done. This is um, a, a studio with an electrostatic spray booth really huge and these are the birds with, uh, um, with the epoxy rich uh, the epoxy coating on top before we put them made them black painted them black and Melissa if you could go to the last one and then we put it back up and it's been fine ever since so this is really the thing that I learned from the case study is that even if I know a fabricator or if I don't know the fabricator that well I really need to double check and I now do site visits and go down and just check in. And then the other thing I've learned is that I usually ask the artist if they're having any problems or challenges I can help them with. But now I know I need to do that with fabricators too. So this is all set now. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Oh yeah, here. Thank you. Uh, I have a historic example to share, and this is a project that I've been working on at the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, this is a photograph by Edward Weston. It's very early. The museum has a very large collection of his work. There's almost 2,300 objects. Um, this comes from his, the very beginning of his career, and it's a part of his career. It's not well known because it doesn't look like what we think Edward Weston photographs look like. They should be sharp focus. They should be very neutral. Uh, he was a bit of pictorialist in his, his early years. Um, but another major reason these works don't get seen very often in the museum is because of this band across the top of the print. Um, it's a different color than the rest of the print. And this has perplexed the curators for a long time, so I got interested. I thought, okay, we can figure this out. Um, it's important to understand what's going on because it affects, our, it affects our interpretation of the materials. So did that area change or did the area around it change? Um, can we have the next slide? These are details just of the recto and the verso. On the back, this is exactly where Weston applied his glue to mount the photograph. So, did the glue bleach the print? Did the glue change something about the print? Did the glue protect the print? This has been the focus of two years of my research and my time. Um, we're getting closer, and if we can go one more slide. Um, just to kind of you know, reassure myself doing my historical research, I found this great letter in the archives at MoMA, and he says, I regret that the glue that I use for mounting stained quite a few of my prints if I remembered which of two brands it was, I would expose it. He does not go on to explain, oh yes, and I used X and Y brands of glue. That would have been too helpful. I don't get to speak to him. <laughs> I wish I could speak through history. That would be fantastic. Um, so oftentimes problems like this come across conservators' desks, and my, my role in the project has been to research. We've taken some samples of the glue. We've determined what the components are. I have a whole system of recreating his process to try to recreate the problem, and the ultimate goal is to determine, can we treat it? Can we make this look better so that this picture can be shown in the museum again? Um, unfortunately, in the case of these photographs, they're incredibly sensitive. Um, it's a palladium photograph, so this is a process that was really popular around the turn of the 20th century. Um, they're becoming popular again. Uh, it's sort of an at-home, you can do it yourself. The chemistry is pretty accessible. Um, but they're incredibly sensitive, so the, the image material sits right on the surface of the paper. Um, and generally, as paper and photograph conservators, we return to using aqueous treatment. So we would want to wash, we might want to light bleach to reduce an issue like this. And unfortunately, because the material is so sensitive, it's not looking very possible. Secondly, because the glue had such an effect, and my, you know, my belief after my research is that the print changed around the glue, so that color in the middle was the initial color. Um, it's gone too far at this point. So we can maybe bring it back a little bit with treatment, but really maybe if Weston had, you know, kind of looked at what his glues were doing or thought about, hey, what, what is this glue anyway before I use it, um, a problem like that might have been preventable. So, thank you. And on the left is a normal light and on the right is an ultraviolet light. An ultraviolet light um, induces a luminescence in certain kinds of materials that can be characteristic of those materials. So varnishes, natural resin varnishes, often have a very distinct fluorescence and that an oil paint will not have. And so what you'll see is um, two things. There's a fluorescent layer glowing here, and then this fluorescent layer up here, both of those layers are varnished. 
So there's paint, and then there's varnish, and then there's paint, and then there's varnish into fresh paint, which you can sort of see swirls up. The pigment sw was fresh still and swirled up into the varnish layer. So the, the varnish can't be removed because the paint will come away with it. And Moreau, as he was working, was working and reworking, varnishing to create saturation, and so that he could then um, reestablish the painting and then build on it. And he was doing all of this. Um, it's the kind of thing where, again, you wish you could say, please. Please don't do that, because I, you know the, the thing is, is that I can understand. That in the moment, he achieved the appearance that he needed, and the the surface and the depth that he required to make what he to, to create his vision. But if, the issue now is that you know 150 years later, the painting is so yellow that we can't see that anymore, and we also can't do anything about it. So we had to learn to live with this result. And unfortunately, what has happened historically is that paintings with this kind of a structure. Um, um, there's many, many artists who work this way. Um, sometimes they did get cleaned and they were, uh, you know, destroyed or really compromised or, or abraded or skinned or worn. And so you see a lot of damage that's occurred because um, people um, embark on a cleaning without doing this kind of analysis that would make them stop. So it's the kind of thing where, again, it's about thinking, I guess it's about it's about making choices. It's not about there's a right thing to do or a wrong thing to do, but there's consequences always to material choices and to understand what those are. So we'd love to be able to clean this picture, but we, we just can't. Hi. Hi. As a paper conservator, we usually have a basket full of case studies because our treatments are shorter than everybody else's. And, and indeed, I, I have one to spill before you. Um, and they, you know, this bushel full or basket full of case studies all have the same problem, and that's poor quality uh, matting and framing. Um, few things I can think are harder on works of art on paper than uh, bad matting, bad framing, and, you know, long term display. Um, this was something I grabbed off the web um, that's just a, it's a typical example. It's an etching by uh, Francis Seymour Hayden who is, uh, you know, if, if any of you have ever pencil signed a, a print that you made yourself, an impression, um, he was somebody who started that pencil signing tradition in the 1850s. And, um, and I, I, nev I never understand why his work is not more highly valued, but it's, it just kind of, it's not very expensive. Beautiful etching. Um, and it was laid down onto an, you know, a secondary support, probably an album page. And then at some point, that album page was uh, gotten hold of by a framer who kind of spread some adhesive across the top and stuck a window mat down on top of it. And then it you know, was on display in a frame for a long time. And you can see uh, that the etching is sort of darker. Uh, you know, just outside the plate mark, there's a signature there too. So long-term exposure. Um, and then someone at some point, I guess, tried to take it out of the, the mat assembly. And so they totally skinned the top margin. So lots of mechanical damage. Um, the, the image area is darkened. And um, let's see, can we advance the next slide? Yeah, okay, so that's where the skinning took place. Um, so I'm, I'm, showing, I'm showing this to you because um, historically uh, framers have been hard on, on works. They do all sorts of things that they're hoping no one finds out about until um, after they're, they've passed on. Um, there are really great framers out there too, but they're, you, you, know, you kind of have to figure out which are which. Um, let's go to the next slide. So that's where the that's where the um, the piece was cropped by the window mat. Um, so there's a mat burn and darkening of the image. Can you keep going? Yep. And then and then the blue you can you can advance that. That's the whole print itself, and then you know it's laid down on a secondary page, which you know has helped to preserve the piece, believe it or not, because it gives it some some reinforcement. And then if we flip this over. Um, this is kind of funny. <clears throat> Framers do this all the time. They just kind of write on the work. This is an example of somebody writing on the secondary support, but they don't hesitate writing on, on the work. And I've even seen uh, 
ballpoint pen write on you know contemporary art framers notes and uh, if you if you advance it one more what do, what do they say Conco to be gilded so I mean there are instructions here um, but they have no qualms I think this happens less this probably happens less these days but um, it's it's hard to it's hard to take care of a work of art on paper and I think um, and display it at the same time. And so I was trying to think of a lesson I could communicate to this crowd, and I think the lesson is if, if you are, if you're somebody who makes works on paper, prints, drawings, and the like, collages, all sorts of things, um, and you envision it to be a glass or framed, in, if you will, to try to maybe take sort of supervise that activity so that you know that it's put together <laughs> properly and not um, leave it up to necessarily your the 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 collector or the purchaser of the of the of the piece and i know that there are a lot of um, additional factors usually costs that come along with that of course but um, it is worth thinking about um, maintaining control about how your piece is mounted and framed Yeah, I forgot to include, but NEDCC actually has really good tutorials about how to map your artwork. I had to do that for grad school, so. I don't know if you wanted to mention, was there something about that? Oh yes, one, one last thing. There, there's something on the back of this uh, secondary support that I will talk about later, and here's, here was a good example. There's an inventory number or a call number or some, something on the back that always makes me stop and say, aha, this, you know, this, this, this was something one time. This was, this was considered important, it was in somebody's collection. And that's something I'm gonna encourage you to think about you know, when we talk about another question. But, so there is one mark on the back that I, I do approve of very much. <laughs> okay, so the next question is, um, many conservators are artists alongside being conservators. Can you share an experience of how your knowledge in art conservation has affected your methods for creating your own artwork? And then, I think Maggie was first. Sure. Um, I think I'm just going to make a prediction here that you're going to hear pretty much a conversation from Christopher and I about glue tonight and adhesives. <laughs> That's going to be a theme. Um, I, I make a lot of photo books. Um, and as I was learning more about 